You're watching Cron On, streaming now from Cron 4, the Bay Area's local news station. More than 300 people across the United States are being tested for the coronavirus. Now here at Cronon, we want to make sure that you have the information, the latest information to keep you and your family safe. And that is why we have brought in Dr. Alexander Evans to answer some questions. We have a phone number that we can push out to you, 415-766-0767. Dr. Alexander Evans is from Marin Health, which used to be Marin General. Yes. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about, we've got some viewer questions, but tell us where, where do we stand now on the coronavirus? Well, it's, it's tough to say because there's still a lot of tests that are out there that are pending. But so far, we've only have heard reports of 12 cases in the United States. And I've also seen published where out of all the tests that have come back, of all the people that have been tested here in the United States, only about 5% have returned positive. Most of these other patients that have been tested had something else, whether they had some other virus or the mm. influenza virus or maybe nothing at all. Uh, so they're being very proactive, that's, and, that, and that's way, the, way, the way they should be, especially with the reports coming out of China. And I think what, a, a big misunderstanding that some people have is that when you get the coronavirus, it's a death sentence, and that's what they're worried about. But that's not necessarily the case, right? I mean, they were prepared for that possibility because the coronavirus is related to another virus called the MERS virus, where there was a high mortality rate with that particular virus. But what we have so far, what we've seen so far, at least in the modern medicine world, is that we have not seen a death sentence. We've seen a lot of patients admitted to the ICU, somewhere maybe between a 5 or 10 percent ICU admission rate. Uh, but I can't comment on the death rate, but it is, it is lower than 5 percent. But it's comparable almost to the, to the flu, just the regular yeah. flu. Oh, yeah. The, the regular influenza virus is quite severe. And I have cases of this that I see on a daily basis in the hospital even today. I was in the ICU seeing very sick patients there. What should people know as far as protecting themselves, kind of like walk us through the facts, the myths, you know, many people have just this alarm concern. Um, it's coming from China. We're not getting a lot of information from there. They, they don't have the health network that we do here with the CDC. So as far as the facts, what do we know about this? I mean, the facts are, uh, or the, 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 fa you know, the facts are, not completely clear just yet because we don't know exactly how contagious it is, but we look at what we know so far, what we, what we hear from either China or locally here, um, is that it behaves like other coronaviruses mm -hmm. and that it's transmitted by droplets. These are droplets that generally travel about four to six feet mm -hmm. um, and drop down to earth and don't float around in the air for hours on end. Um, so, which makes it less contagious than other things which could do that. Um, this is transmitted by breathing it in. Um, so therefore, people protecting themselves with masks, whether it's a simple face mask or something called an N95 mask, which uh, is a particulate mask, removes more uh, matter. Uh, those can be protective in, in scenarios where you're dealing with a, a real case. Um, but uh, there, there are a lot of a lot of uh, fiction out there too, primarily because of the fact that there's a lot unknown and so there's a lot of fear in this because the virus does present in a really common way, cough, fever, and shortness of breath. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if you ask me what illnesses look like that, I can tell you about 100 or 300 of them. Right. Um, so it is, it, that can make it scary. Um, and so a lot of the unknowns out there, that, that's what makes it challenging. We have some viewer questions. So Christina um, Aiden says, how long does the coronavirus last in the human body? That's a really good question. Uh, so far, what we know is it's 14 days. The 14 days is, is really the cutoff that they're looking to see generally when people potentially could get exposed or and then beyond, beyond that 14 day mark, whether they develop symptoms or not. Now, the difficult question is, is how long does it last if they actually have had an infection? We don't necessarily know the answer of that. That can depend on the patient. So somebody like those 12 patients who've been sick, they're looking at that right now and seeing how long they're going to secrete that virus for. And they have to test for that. And we will hopefully find out. For, for instance, for like the flu, that can last for days 
But for some people who are immunocompromised, patients who are on cancer chemotherapy, they can secrete the influenza virus or the flu virus for weeks, and they're already better. They may even have no symptoms, but they still leak a little bit out in their, from their mouth as well as maybe other parts of their body. Wow, so fascinating. Is, with regard to that, is there, I mean, there's always, you, you see people and they say, oh, I'm no longer contagious. It's the first three, four days, I'm no longer contagious. But you're saying but some people, can, their symptoms can be gone, they're better, but they can still transmit those. They those, can still be a carrier. Really, yeah. yeah, it really depends on the patient. Um, really, the degree, degree of contagiousness is based on how, how, if the person really is coughing or not. I mean, that's really what propels it. Mm. Um, also, whether they're practicing good hand hygiene or not, because you could have virus and not get anyone sick whatsoever. If you're covering your mouth with, you know, with a Kleenex, not a bare hand, coughing into your shoulder, um, or perhaps washing your hands soap and water. We've got Brian from Burlingame. He has a question. Uh, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, the question I have, doctor, is that uh, does the mask really help? Because I know a lot of uh, people are ordering the mask, and in China, they're ordering hundreds of thousands of masks uh, to uh, uh, avoid uh, contact with the coronavirus. Is it helping uh, the person that has it or doesn't have it, or both? Uh, really good question. Um, th there are still a lot of unknowns in terms of the contagiousness of this exact virus, so I'm sure there's going to be some published data for this. Um, but we do know, in the, at least in the hospital setting, if we were to have a case, we're masking up not only with a N95 mask with a real case, but also uh, uh, gear to protect the eyes, either with goggles or a face shield. And we also gown up. But we're being extra cautious in the hospital setting because people who are truly sick with it, especially very sick individuals who are hospitalized that are coughing a lot more and perhaps have more virus, are more able to spread it. Uh, so, however, outside of the hospital, um, I would argue um, that a simple face mask uh, would be uh, quite effective, and we've shown it to be effective even with other viruses too. So what I mean by a simple face mask is one of the, the cheaper ones um, and, and not the tight N95 mask, which is a little bit harder to breathe through. Now that one in of itself probably will prevent more virus coming through, uh, but the compliance of wearing that, that's a different question. People may be taking that on and off, touching it, and then when you touch the outside of the mask, and then you touch your face, there's a problem there. So when you say a simple mask, what, what are you talking about? Um, so it's, it's it, we call it a surgical mask. It's, it. it's, a, it's a simple one Just layer mask. Yeah. 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 And it's, yeah. and it's a disposable thing. Too. It's disposable. And I, yeah. I have them in my house. I mean, I wear them when my kids are sick no, um, with the flu. Yeah. Um, and the I, don't get, I don't get the flu. The ones when, that we see in uh, yes. the TV yes. show. I, I wear it. And um, it, it is effective. But also really the key thing, it's not just the mask. It's, it's really washing your, your, your hands with soap and water, 20 to 30 seconds. Okay. That has been proven in science that just that intervention of alone prevents so much infection. Uh, but that is something where, you know, when I have medical students, I, 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 that's the first lesson I go through with them is how to wash their hands because a lot of people don't do it correctly. Okay. And again, yeah. soap, warm water, 20 seconds. Yep. Thank you so much, Brian. Okay. We're going to go to our next question from Cliff Bartolome. Uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. If I mispronounced that, if you're, he says, if you're a nurse taking care of a patient with corona, should they be considered one to one? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So one to what? Really, really good question. What one to one means is that do you have one nurse per patient? Yeah, mm -hmm. and we do this commonly, not just. I mean, not that we have any coronavirus patients in our hospital, but if we were to have another p patient that has something incredibly contagious, and there's many things out there, I don't want to scare too many people. However, yeah, we generally do a one-to-one, -one, so that means one nurse, one patient, sh that nurse, he or she is not going to potentially spread it to other patients, because no matter how great of hand hygiene he or she's going to do, um, there's always that potential risk of what we call donning and doffing uh, the, clo uh, the, the, the gown and the gowns. So uh, donning and doffing. Donning means putting it on. Doffing means taking it off. It's, it's a challenge. It can be a real challenge. Yeah. And they saw that challenge with the Ebola outbreak. Thank goodness we didn't see many cases of that. But that's where the challenge was biggest. It is the, the flip side, the silver lining in all of these illnesses that we really can study and then use some of that information salient information to move forward and to better protect ourselves. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I like the fact that we get to reiterate all this all over again because once people get in the habit of doing all these things, it's going to protect them from so many other things I can think of. Yeah. Uh, next question, Facebook question, Raphael Angel uh, Sandoval. Uh, number one, can we get it from products shipped from China? No. No, I don't think there's been any proof of that. Um, this virus is not going to live on surfaces for a prolonged period of time. Uh, so... There are some things you can get picked up from shipments from all over the world. Some things can live in spores and can last for days, other types of illnesses, but not, but not this one. So I, I don't think that's going to be a risk. And I think that that's been, uh, you know, we've got the Lunar year, New Year coming, and there's many people who are staying away from the parade, and a lot of businesses have been suffering just because people are fearful, uh, and that's kind of borrowing on the next question. Yeah. If someone with the coronavirus has touched the same currency as you, could you be at risk? You know, that, that's transmission by fomites, so that's on surfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, that also has not been proven with mm -hmm. this particular coronavirus. Um, so that's really hard to say. I would have to say no. I don't think that currency is going to transmit it. If it's, if, if it's going to be anything at all, it would be like somebody just touching the sink and you just touching the sink right after then, almost instantaneously after. Uh, but not, not, but not on a, a, a piece of, of currency or paper like that. No. For our viewers at home, if you'd like to call in and have a question for Dr. Evans, our phone number is four one five seven six six zero seven six seven. Once again, four one five seven six six zero seven six seven. We are taking your calls, uh, and Dr. Evans will answer them. And uh, Andy Paul Cabrera is wearing a mask effective. If the infected droplets enter your eyes, will you acquire the virus or is it only transmitted if it enters your mouth or nose? Yes, uh, re another really good question. So there is concern about the possibility of transmission through the eyes, and that's why in the hospital setting, um, if we were to have a case, it would be recommended to um, wear eye protection. And we also do that for other viruses too. The influenza virus, we do that especially if you're going and having the patient like cough for you mm -hmm. or do like some sort of maneuver where you know they're gonna expel sputum into the air. Yes, you're gonna definitely wanna protect your eyes because there is concern of transmission mm -hmm. that way. And that's yeah. why washing your hands is so important because a lot of people, they will go scratch their eye or they'll you know be around their eye and oh, that's yeah. obviously. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and there's no doubt about that, yeah. There's okay. no doubt. We have a question from Robert uh, Grijalva. He says, how did this disease just sun suddenly pop up out of nowhere? He asks, is it man-made? Ooh, I, you know, that's probably looking a little bit too much on the internet there in terms of the <laughs> man-made thing. Um, it, there's no uh, official report out there that that's a possibility. Um, just uh, let him know that these viruses mutate all the time. In, in fact, the coronavirus is a virus that has its ability to replicate, it uses this DNA machinery, and it makes a lot of mistakes, the DNA. And so when it makes mistakes, it actually creates mutations. And some mutations may kill the virus, may make it less infective. Some mutations in this DNA make it more infective. And when you get different species where animals come and go, humans get mixed with that, I think you see China's that perfect example where there is a, a large rural population, maybe not, possibly not even the healthiest of population, not great potentially health care maybe out in those areas, and a lot of animal exposure. So it's that perfect soup. So really with any of us, not to lay blame on China, but the fact is, is that that is a, a perfect sort of mix to um, see. Um, these novel, novel viruses come about. And it's important to note, back, we, we were talking about the Mars, that came from a camel. Yeah, yeah, and that was not known initially. Mm -hmm. So that took a while to identify that that MERS virus, which is a virus, a coronavirus, about three years ago, that hit, hit basically the uh, Arabian Peninsula, and they saw uh, an out, a small outbreak in Korea um, when a patient went there and was hospitalized and spread it to a whole bunch of other people. Yeah, it was, it was from a camel. So these viruses are in camels, they're in cats, they're in other types of reptiles. So if you have a place where a lot of these animals are together and they kind of mix in this and that, and then you have humans so buying together, this stuff, right, living right. together, and they may not be that healthy and sick, there you go. How do they determine, how do they trace it back, like the camel or, or, or H1N1, you know, swine flu, how do they determine where the uh, 
virus originated? Great question. Uh, testing. I mean, they, they test basically with DNA. They detect the DNA. And then they do antibody tests on the different mm -hmm. animals. And they see, oh, wow, they, they do have antibodies to this. This mm -hmm. is probably the reservoir. And so the, it was the thing with the swine flu that, that happened, what, about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. um, where there was a mix of DNA from human, pig, and bird all in one. H1 and so, yeah, yeah, exactly. The H1N1, which we yeah. still see today. I mean, right. I saw patients today with H1N1, N1. you know, suffering from that. So, um, and we worry about future viruses developing in that way. Um, luckily, there's a lot of research going into creating vaccines for that, which is probably our best armamentarium outside of hand, good hand hygiene and hand washing to prevent these viruses. And th these are the times where we really want to pay attention to the agencies like the CDC and public health <sighs> about the importance of making sure we're making those investments from a federal level into those departments because those are instrumental in keeping us all safe. I love the CDC. I mean, they they... they Everyone looks up to them from around the world. Mm -hmm. China has their own CDC called the China CDC. They literally name it right after our <laughs> CDC. Uh, so it, the problem is when you look at local health departments, mm -hmm. uh, it's unfortunate even in Marin, those are the areas where sometimes get cut right. uh, because you know everything's going fine and dandy for the moment. But when you know stuff happens, and it usually happens when you don't want it to happen, here you go. And, they are really, really good workers there. I used to work at the Marin County Health Department, no longer work there any, any longer, but um, really good people there um, and working close with the state because the state has its own level of bureaucracy as well as the CDC, all of that intermixing. And there's been a lot of that going on right now. A lot of great guidance from the CDC. I give them props. And then what's important to mention is that we've got this fast track that's going on, the 16 labs that have now been tapped, including one in Richmond, so that they can fast track these. Yep, yep, and that's great because California, we got the biggest population, so we, we, we need Richmond up and running testing. And I'm sure with all the patients coming on in, they're having lots of specimens. They got big demand right there. That's the problem in China right now. The problem in China is that they have so many cases, they can't test them all. Mm -hmm. their, their labs are completely overwhelmed. So they're probably testing the sickest of patients. And that's the question. We don't know really the true number. There are, I would assume, just my guess, but probably an educated guess, that there are a lot of very mild cases. And mm -hmm. so uh, we don't know the true denominator, that N number of what we're dealing with here. Yeah. Um, other questions. We've got the phone number again, 415-766-0767 if you'd like to call in. And then we have a question from Luis Melli. What's the percentage of surviving, uh, we mentioned this a little earlier, if you do get inve infected with the coronavirus? Uh, really good question. I mean, I, th I believe we're seeing uh, somewhere in the low single digit percentage in terms of sur survival rate, but, but we don't know this just yet. I mean, if you look at the CDC website right now, it's a big unknown of if you get it, how well you're going to do. Low single digit of a, a fatality. A fatality. Exactly. High, yeah, yeah, high yeah. double digit right. of survival. Yes, yes. yes. More, yes. more than 90% survival rate, um, which we were very worried about because, like I alluded to, the SARS and the MERS, when it was around, it was higher. And so that's why that big concern was. Now, the, the regular coronavirus, that causes the common cold in one-third of cold cases. So there are coronaviruses that are circulating. We test for them all the time at the state level. This is a novel, different coronavirus that, for whatever reason, is stronger and has made that leap to just binding to the respiratory mucosa better and causing illness. Thankfully, does not seem to be as sickening as the, the MERS virus, but, but, but there's, st there's still a lot of unknowns, unfortunately. And a lot of people may not know, I actually didn't know that coronavirus is a type, a type of virus. We've had other coronaviruses. Oh, yeah. Coronavirus, because uh, our producer and I, she pulled up a Clorox wipes container and it says, you know, kills 99% of coronavirus. And she's like, wait, I don't understand. This just came out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, they, they, it, I wonder if they're going to give it a name because right now it's just called the novel coronavirus, right, right. which is interesting. Uh, because the other two viruses, it seemed like we get a new coronavirus every decade. In the 2000 decade, it was the SARS. La mm -hmm. Last decade, it was the MERS, uh, which stands for a Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And now we have the novel coronavirus. So I'm not sure if it's going to get a name. I'm not sure if China wants to name it. It's not, it's not the Wuhan virus. Who knows? Right. I, I don't know what they're going to do with this. But um, 
There's a lot of research going out there and things are coming back fast, but sometimes too fast. You gotta be cautious about reading stuff too fast because mm -hmm. there was stuff reported out in, in journals, even big journals where they, it's not completely final whether that was even accurate information. Right. And so you can get a lot out of that, but you also can take sometimes bad things away from it. Uh, Karen French um, wrote in and said, what are the first symptoms and how does one survive this virus once infected? Oh, good question. Uh, the symptoms are vague, but most patients have fever. So I believe it's somewhere between 80 to 90 percent of people have a fever. But that okay. doesn't mean that that's, that's just but that. Like a fever that spikes, all of a sudden you're very feverish? They, re I really can't tell you how high the fever okay. is going to go. Um, that's a really good question. I don't think we know that answer. Okay. Um, it would be somewhere between low grade and high grade. I don't okay. think it differentiate between the two. But most of the other patients, also common symptoms, were a productive cough, okay. um, shortness of breath uh, was common, especially with the severe cases. And about 20, 30 percent of patients had GI complaints like diarrhea, huh. Huh. Um, which again alludes to more of that viral syndrome, which mm -hmm. we see with other viruses like the H1N1 right. caused GI complaints right. too. And yeah. that's why it's important if you do have symptoms of the flu or what you think could be the flu, contact or corona. Health, or corona. Don't go in. Call. Contact the, your health provider because even if it's just a simple cold, it could be potentially the coronavirus. Yeah. And well, I mean, really, the patients who are at most risk are patients who have either, I mean, especially patients who have been to Wuhan, China and have to come back here, patients who have just been in China in general, or people who have been in contact with known people that have had this illness. Mm -hmm. Really, other people, it's. It just we, we haven't shown anyone else to be concerned other than the, the, that, that risky group. Yeah. Um, but that group is slightly enlarging, but, but let's, let's, put it, let's put the information in front of us here. We have 12 cases in the United States to date. We have millions and millions of people in our country. This year alone, we've had 19 million cases of flu. Hmm. We've had 10,000 deaths from the seasonal flu. So wow. let's put that in perspective versus, um, versus the 12 cases believe only two or three of which have been hospitalized, none of which have had complications. And that's why the CDC doesn't necessarily recommend the mask yet, because they say the U.S. and the Bay Area, we're uh, a low risk right now. Right. If you're just talking about the coronavirus. If you're yeah. talking yeah. about, <laughs> right? I mean, because it yeah. goes into that umbrella, right? Well, all viruses are pretty contagious. Right. I mean, it, exactly. it, there are some viruses that are much worse. Smallpox is an example of one of them that's yeah. incredibly contagious. We don't see it anymore because of vaccines, thankfully. Yeah. Um, but uh, all viruses, are they're pretty darn contagious. Right. And so, um, and they get, I mean, generally viruses are spread by patients who are sick and not covering their mouth and spreading yeah. to other people. And really the ones you want to protect are are. are are patients over 65 and patients with uh, chronic lung diseases or the other health, health um, problems. Last yeah. question we have here. Um, Mina Lewis, um, what is the treatment for the virus? We don't have one. Ooh, the treatment, right now the treatment is supportive. So what yeah. I mean by supportive is we, we treat their symptoms. So if they have a high, high fever, we give them acetaminophen or Tylenol. Mm -hmm. um, if they need to be, if they have severe respiratory distress and they have to have a tube put in there, they, they do that. There are some experimental treatments that are being tested. There was one experimental tr uh, treatment that was used in the Seattle patient. Um, it was a drug by Gilead. Um, and we don't know what it did. <laughs> There's mm -hmm. no proof of it, but they have tried in other types of coronaviruses. And so we're like, what the heck? We might as well just use it. It's not shown to be harmful in any way. Um, they also, there have been reports in China because there is this, there's this HIV drug combination, this older combination known as Kalitra, or that was the brand name back in the day, it's called Laponavir Ritonavir. It had been used and studied in the MERS virus, um, been shown to have some efficacy, so that meaning efficacy means it would uh, show de clearing of the virus in not only humans as well as in animals, that they were using it in s as select cases over there in China and anecdotally having some success. So there's, there's hope that there's stuff out there. And I can almost guarantee it if they test all the drugs in the world, I'm sure they'd find something that would work against it. The problem is you have to run clinical trials mm -hmm. and that takes time. That really does, that, that, that's an arduous process, an expensive process too. And you said the vaccine for the coronavirus could take a couple months, you said? Well, that, they're, they're the... working on it right now. So the vaccine for the coronavirus, they're, they're, they're hot and heavy on that. Yeah. Uh, and the, the news out is that they'll probably be ready by human trials within a few months. 
So I was hearing something through the grapevine uh, in uh, April, perhaps. So that's human trials. So what I mean by human trials, that means that they would give the vaccine to human beings and they would see that it wouldn't hurt the human, wouldn't cause side effect, and that uh, that same person would have a bump in an antibody that they would check. Once they would go through human uh, test, then they would kind of put it out there. And they've done this already. So um, it really hasn't made the news, but there's been a, a great um, uh, thing with the Ebola virus. There's been a vaccine that's come out that's been amazingly successful, 90% efficacious wow. against Ebola. Yeah. The problem is getting people to use it. Right. So when you when you when you when you give a drug when you give a vaccine out to sometimes a, a setting of people who don't believe in it, that can be a problem too. Now we have a viewer question uh, from John. He says, "What groups?" He's from Walnut Creek. He says, what groups are most at risk? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, we don't have anything published to tell us exactly what patients' severe disease occurred in, but what we're hearing, it is patients who are probably over the age of 50, certainly over 65, and chronic lung ailment, chronic lung disease. This is what I mean by that. Um, COPD, emphysema, um, other types of lung diseases like that. Cancer, they're, they're, yeah, imagine. cancer patients, definitely, right. most definitely. So, um, but, but they're the most vulnerable HIV? for all. Uh, AIDS, AIDS, probably, yeah. I, would, I would imagine. Okay. Um, but, but that's unknown. That's, that's, right. really, that, that's really unknown. I could imagine that would be a risk factor because okay. it is risk factors for other things. For children as well. Children, you know what, to tell you the truth, there really haven't been much reports of children being sick with this. I think they did report the first child death in China, but there have been about 600 plus deaths. Right. So there hasn't been much report out of children death there, which is interesting. Yeah. And I believe we have another question of, is the flu deadlier than the coronavirus? Ooh, really good question. I think uh, <laughs> unknown. However, I'd argue probably yes. Why is it? Because it's more common. It's more common. It's out there, um, and people don't necessarily protect themselves for it fully against it, um, especially when you talk about other strains of flu which aren't circulating much, otherwise known as the bird flu. So that's not the H1N1 that's circulating predominantly now. That's otherwise known as the H5N1. Mm -hmm. That's exceedingly deadly. Um, and. Uh, they just actually came out with a vaccine. It was just actually approved hmm. for it in the last uh, month. So that's really exciting. That so is. if there was an outbreak of the deadly bird flu, they'd be able to actually circulate this out and give it to first responders. Uh, one um, thing I wanted to bring up, uh, a lot of people go to hand sanitizers. Mm -hmm. Better to ha wash your hands. Yeah, soap and water is definitely best, especially if your hands are soiled. What I mean by soiled, it means that there's like clear mucus or other types of par a particulate on the hands. Definitely mm -hmm. better. But to increase compliance, the thing about compliance, okay, at the hospital level, compliance is never 100%. They're actually, the, you get great, hospitals get graded on this stuff. They get graded on how good their hand hygiene, and this gets reported at the state level, and that's got to be good rates. Mm -hmm. The way we do it at Marin Health, we actually have an electronic thing that we wear in our jacket that detects wow. when we enter the room. And I'll be honest, uh, us infectious disease doctors, we do have the highest rates. So we're, we're approaching 100% success. And I don't, can't remember a single time I don't go in and out of the room. So I do mostly do the alcohol-based okay. because it is pretty effective. It is time efficient. Uh, but certainly certain infections, certain um, types of gastroenteritis are mm -hmm. spread um, w in, in a different way. And it's not killed by hand sanitizer. I always do hand hygiene with soap and water and singing happy birthday two times in my head. Warm water. Yeah, warm water. Yeah, yeah. warm water. Yeah, warm water, soap. And, um, you know, there's a certain technique getting under your fingernails, getting your thumbs, and getting the back of the hands. That There's a technique to it. Yeah, important to oh, teach. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah, and you can't teach it enough. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I believe that uh, that does it for us. So yeah. I want to thank you very much, doctor, for coming. Yeah. Doctor, oh, yeah. we have one oh. more question. Sorry. <laughs> Michael from Mill Valley says, how is it spread? We don't know. I mean, Ooh, how is the coronavirus spread? Yeah. Um, you know, we don't know where, who, who did it or where, where it started because, unfortunately, we, we don't have that early information. Maybe there'll be a movie about it or be some sort of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, get, uh, to get us up to speed. You know, there have been movies about this sort of stuff, Gwyneth Paltrow and all. We know that was Wuhan, <laughs> and, and the Wuhan uh, province in China, that was where Hubei. Uh, yeah, they where had it a was seafood detected. market. They, yeah. had a, they had a market, live animal seafood market, 
where they were reporting lots of cases. They and in call fact, it a wet market. A wet mar exactly. A wet market where there are live and dead animals mm -hmm. being sold, probably including a, an urban population, of course, because that area was urban, heavily urbanized, but probably a pretty good rural population coming in contact, mm -hmm. perfect storm. And a doctor who had just reported that out there had just died mm -hmm. from this. Um, he's the one that sort of alerted authorities initially about seeing lo cases and that was like a, a commonality was coming from this wet market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, scary thought uh, because, you know, we, not that we have these sort of wet markets here, uh, but, you know, you, you, just, to, just, you know, we can, we can think of things that are related. Right. And again, it's spread through droplets in the air. Someone droplets coughs, in the air. Yep. Sneezes. Yep. It's droplets in the air. So these these are large droplets. These aren't tiny, tiny droplets. So they're not suspended in the air for hours on end. Some viruses are transmitted that way. So, for instance, like the chickenpox virus that pretty much everyone got when they were younger back in the day, um, that one suspends in the air for hours. Hmm. And that's why everyone got sick. <laughs> yes. You didn't need to rub against everyone because it was actually airborne. Did you get the chimpox? I did. It yeah. was airborne. It was, it was in the air. Mild, so you didn't rub, it. need to rub against anyone. Oh, it was gosh. airborne. It's Everybody suspended got in the, the air. So this will suspend in the air for a certain degree, but not for hours on end. Okay. Um, however, when we do, when we when we will hospitalize a patient, we'll we'll put them in the, the most strictest of airborne room just in case. Mm -hmm. um, but like with other viruses, coronaviruses. Um, yeah, large droplets that tend to go about four to six feet and drop to the earth. Um, and so they've actually, the CDC has really confirmed this. So they even given out diagrams showing who's at risk on an airplane if you're sitting next to someone. And if you were more than six feet away, they felt that you were actually low risk, according to the CDC. Hmm. And they're pretty smart people that work there. Fascinating. All right, I think that's it. I believe we have a couple more questions a few more questions coming in. Um, again, if you want to call and ask us, and ask Dr. Evans rather, any questions, the number is 415-766-0767. Um, the reason it's spread so rapidly in China, I mean, it's been there for, we don't know how long it's been there, but is it because it's such a densely populated region of the world? No. It's four to six feet is, is, a, is not too far, but it's also not very close. Yeah, and it's not. It, it, but if it is as contagious as the uh, run-of-the-mill influenza A, then there you go. I mean, that, that, that in of itself spreads like wildfire every single year. So if it's just as contagious as that, now we don't know if it is, if it is or isn't, then yeah, then that, that, that's, that's what we're seeing and that's what was. So if you get the coronavirus real quick, and you get better, are you somewhat immune to it? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't think we know that yet, but one would have to think yes. So we'll see about that because okay. that happened with the Zika. The Zika had came right. out. Mm -hmm. I wasn't on the news back then, but maybe I could have been. <laughs> uh, but people were protected. You couldn't get it again. So mm -hmm. it went through like those islands in the middle of South Pacific. Everyone got it, and then no one got it again. And then so, it died out like that. And it died out. And there's no more cases unless you introduced another person who was naive to it and never right. had it. Yeah. So, um, yes, that, that is a thought. But, but we'll see because for some illnesses, some antibodies that develop in the body aren't protective, yeah. aren't lifelong. And we see that with the influenza virus where we get protective antibodies. Not so great, though. Not so great. Not necessarily lifelong. A little bit, but not, not, not great. Last question. Uh, does it cause organ damage? Uh, yes, uh, because of the fact that when patients get sick with this, not the virus itself per se, uh, but it, it generally will cause something called shock. Hmm. And, and, uh, and a lot of viruses or other illnesses can do that, and that's where the organ damage happens. So okay. it, it, it basically drops people's blood pressure, and that's where you see the organ damage. But really the main organ that it damages um, is the lungs. I, I mean, that's say, really the lungs. Right. Some viruses, I, don't, I'm, I haven't seen any reports of this, but one would have to assume that it could go to other parts of the body, um, particularly sensitive areas of like the brain and stuff like that, because that can happen in flu, um, really bad cases of flu. So, uh, but the lungs get, get obviously damaged. Get you, yeah. mentioned, you mentioned the liver earlier. How does that play a role? Um, well, the liver is such a critical organ um, and certainly is a risk factor uh, for uh, the uh, run-of-the-mill seasonal influenza. So I can't imagine a um, person who has cirrhosis or end-stage liver disease uh, 
if they got exposed to this virus, mm. I would imagine they would do very poorly because they generally have lower antibody levels just in general. Their bodies don't produce as much antibody because the liver is actually a very important immune organ. All right, I guess we have one more question from a viewer. How do you tell the difference between coronavirus and the flu? Oh, uh, really good question because the symptoms are going to look really identical, honestly. Um, it's going to be really testing. It's yeah. going to be testing and exposure history. That's really it's right. going to be. Um, that's how we're going to tell the difference. The um, and that goes back to the importance of having those labs up and running so that you can oh. get the, qu the quick results. Yeah, we're very happy that Richmond's uh, being able to test that uh, so the delay's not there. Because you imagine mm -hmm. shipping all the way to Atlanta mm -hmm. um, where the CDC is located. Yeah, there's going to be delay there. So having here in Richmond. And then, you know, Richmond's going to do, uh, the state's going to have their own test and being able to develop their own machinery and things like that with the hope that there could be a more rapid test that could be like on the spot. Because the thing is, though, you want to be able to just take a patient sitting right here, give them a test and know the result in 30 minutes. Right. We have that for the flu right now in the hospital. You come through the hospital, I can have a result in 30 minutes, hmm. whether you have influenza A or B, or even if you have RSV, but not for coronavirus. Yeah. Can you have influenza A or B in addition to the coronavirus? I imagine you could have a co-infection. I've not heard that, but, but, but their co-infections definitely can occur. I guess we have more questions coming in. Um, Melrose says, is there an over-the-counter testing kit available? Uh -uh. Nope. Nope. And, and I wouldn't expect that anytime soon. Yeah. I really wouldn't. Uh, like I said, it's tested at the state level now. It was the national level. Um, and the concern is, what I have the most of the concern is places that can't test. So places like in Africa where they literally have two labs in all of Africa to test there. Right. That's a concern because it could spread badly there. So here we're protected. We're, we're being very proactive. Um, it's been the first quarantine of an infectious disease in I don't even know how long. Um, that's that's now been ordered. So we we're, they're taking it seriously. Whether they're doing too much, that's arg uh, an ar an argument there. I've I've even read things online about how maybe we're doing too much. But I, I think it's important. I think the public uh, probably is going to demand want demand something like this. And yeah. what's the difference between being quarantined and isolation? That's a really good question. Um, I th I think that there is some blurring between the two, but most patients are being home isolated. So they're trusting people who are in the lower risk to watch what they do, don't go out to public places, don't go to the movie theater that week, and stay at home, order in or eat all the food in the house. Versus quarantine where, yes, you are a known case, you are staying quarantined, you ain't, you're not leaving there until we have tested you negative. That's a totally different story. And they have units favorably here that are built for that possibility. They've been proactive. But then again, there are other infections which need quarantine too. That's why we have stuff like this available here in the U.S. We do have families being quarantined over at Travis Air Force Base yep. right now. So yep. we have another question right now. Uh, let's see. They're pull it up on the screen for us. All right, they're pulling it up. Um, again, if you'd like to call in with a question for Dr. Evans, the number is 415-766-0767. And the question is from Israel. It says, will the flu vaccine protect me from the coronavirus? No, it won't. The flu vaccine will definitely not protect from the coronavirus, but it'll protect you from the flu. Um, we don't know the percentages of how effective the flu is going to be this year. Usually we hear around this time of, of the year in February, so I'm anticipating something being reported out from the CDC. Maybe they're busy with something else. Um, <laughs> um, but um, usually the flu uh, vi vaccine is about 50% average effective, Some bad years, 40%, 30%, good years, 70%. It's definitely not going to protect against coronavirus. But what's going to protect you is going to be washing your hands. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, doctor. We really appreciate it. Dr. Alexander Evans from Marin Health, used to be Marin General, <laughs> but we really appreciate all of your expertise and, you know, fielding people's questions about this coronavirus. Yeah, cool. Thanks Great. for your time. Thanks. You're watching Cron On, streaming Bay Area News 24-7.